diagnose or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, a psychotherapist and author of the author and the originator of the awareness integration theory. And hello to Sean, our director at the studio. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. Today, I will share the tip of the week about how we handle being belittled or the way we belittle others and the impact of that. And then I will share the latest research about children born to mothers who are depressed during and after pregnancy are more likely to develop depressive symptoms themselves by the age of 24. And I'm excited to have a chat with Radha Ruparel. Uh, she is a global cross-sector leader with expertise in leadership development and personal transformation. She has worked with CEOs, Fortune 500, senior executives, social entrepreneurs, and grassroots leaders around the world and has the Collective Leadership Accelerator at Teacher, Teach for All, Teach for All. And it's a global network of independent organizations, 60 countries committed to developing leadership in classroom communities to ensure all children fulfill their potential. She is also the author of the Amazon top seller, Brave Now, Rise Through Struggle and Unlock Your Greatest Self. I will answer then to your questions of this week. Why do we make so much effort to create something and then we sabotage ourselves? So um, hope to shed some light on that. Now, please subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast, connect with me, share with me through all of the social medias, whichever you like, I'm on all of them. I'd love to hear from you, hear your comments, hear your questions, and to be able to connect with you. So go to my website, fujan.com. That's also a place to connect with me. But um, first, here's the tip of the week. Fujian Zane. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach for the past 30 years, and I'm the originator of the awareness integration therapy. I'd love to be able to support you in any matters of life that shows up for you that you need support. So call me at 818-648-2140. I am available to do online therapy or coaching, anyone who's around the world. And my, you can also join me in my office in San Clemente, California, if you like to uh, come to the office. So call me at 818-648-2140 or go to fujon.com. I look forward to hearing from you and having the opportunity to support you in things that are in your life and you just want to excel and create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. This is to all of you therapists, counselors, coaches, and teachers out there offering you my latest book, Awareness Integration Therapy, Clear the Past, Create a New Future, and live a fulfilled life now. Every person that reaches out to a psychotherapist, a counselor, or a coach is seeking to learn skills that can be utilized daily to foster a successful and fulfilling life. So this book offers an effective tool to all psychotherapists and coaches for supporting their clients to become aware of their inner process and to be accountable for it, as well as the results in all areas of their lives with the utmost level of care and acceptance. This is a must read for all of you clinicians and coaches who desire to offer a deep therapeutic work in a brief period of time suited for this era. 
Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zane. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Here's the tip of the week. Have you ever been belittled by anyone? I've noticed this week people's reactions when they experience being belittled by someone. Whether someone intended to belittle them or was just stating a fact or sharing their anger, it had a similar effect on the receiver at first. Clarifying someone did not uh, purposely belittle them might alleviate the pain. However, if the act of belittling was deliberate, then rage sets in. When I ask people to let me know which memories sourced their anger and insisted on revisiting them, they realized that the ones they felt belittled by someone or some situation was prevalent, constant. The feeling of shame that gets triggered by being belittled is very toxic. When someone has high esteem and confidence, they're not affected personally. However, they do get angry at the person who purposely tried to belittle them. They will either choose to play the power game and go for the win, communicate assertively, or choose to leave the game. For someone who has a low confidence or low self-esteem, they might take it very personally. They might feel the shame and think that they deserve to be belittled or humiliated and withdrawn or get defensive and fight, and sometimes fight to death on that. A person who intends to belittle someone in a verbal aggressive attack, uses sarcasm or plays aggressive, passive aggressive, is using the verbal attacks and gestures as a strategy to hurt or overpower another person. This can easily be seen in all relationships of an intimate relationship, marriages, of working environment, coworkers, boss and employee, parent and child, teenagers and parents. Some people are angry and are expressing their anger or being defensive and not realizing that they are, um, their way of expressing anger is by belittling people. Others are using belittling as their humor and trying to get attention by getting a mutual laugh from others by belittling another person. Regardless of the reason, it is painful for the one receiving it. So let's observe. So I'm gonna ask you questions and I request for you to observe yourself. Be honest with yourself. Is belittling others one of your strategies for overpowering? Is belittling others one of your coping mechanisms? That's the way you cope with the world because you figure that's the only way to create power in a world that you might feel powerless. Do you belittle others just for getting attention as if that's the only way you know how to get a positive attention in a negative way? Do you need to feel superior to others? Do you feel inferior and want to act superior with belittling everybody else to prove that you are not inferior to them. And not that you are, but is it like there's a way that you feel inferior and that's why you act that way? To defend yourself by belittling others? To even notice when you're belittling others? I get that a lot when um, working with couples or even parents. And um, they're not really aware that their words is up to down and belittling. They just figure, I'm just sharing a fact. But a fact can be shared in many, many different ways. And sometimes it's a habit that we figure we've acquired and um, just continue without really noticing. 
How do you feel when you perceive being beat and belittled? If you are the receiver, what happens to you when you perceive it that way? How do you react when you perceive being belittled? Do you get angry? Do you fight back? Do you belittle back? Um, do you isolate? Do you withdraw? What do you do? What do you think about yourself when you perceive being belittled? Do you think like, I'm nothing, um, I'm no good, I'm a damaged good, I'm um, nobody, that's why they have the idea to do this. Do you handle it differently when you perceive someone deliberately belittles you versus unintentionally? Do you get more enraged? Do you want to get revenge? Do you uh, go after them? Do you hold and brew the revenge in your, you know, in your thought process? Uh, do you do it both, whether they did it intentionally, or do you do it more when you think somebody did it purposefully? Do you feel more threatened by someone who did it purposefully? Do you think you deserve it to be belittled? Do you feel powerless over it? Do you handle it differently if it's done when no one is around versus publicly? Is that what you experience? Like, oh, if somebody belittled me in front of others, I must go ahead and belittle them in front of others too. I must humiliate them in front of others. But if they don't, um, if it's just me and them, then it can be on a personal level because nobody else was there. And how do you proceed with your relationship with that person? Do you guard up? Um, do you always feel like in competition with them? Do you feel like I have to uh, create something in my, in, in my surrounding where they cannot get too close? Um, do you always look at them with um, ways to find their vulnerability so you can go back and belittle them? Or is it more like, I just don't want to be around these people. So kind of like, move back and say, no, 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 no. I don't want them around. Um, or you placate and it's like, okay, as long as I'm not in their radar, it's going to be okay. Or if I make them like me I, and I would do anything for them to like me, maybe they just stop doing that. Um, how do your parents be little to you? Did you get, are you used to that? And because you're used to it as like a familiar water that you've swam in, then when other people do it to you, you react to it in a similar way you've done since childhood or that you do it to others in such um, a way that it's just been a part of your language. So these are all the ways that you can monitor um, that way of being. For sure, if there is some sort of a, power game that is there continuously. Um, it disrupts relationship. It does not allow safety, trust, closeness to happen when that's part of the game. A lot of times, obviously, it happens. Most of us experience those things as, you know, as, as uh, maybe early as um, elementary school, definitely junior high. That's what we do best. Like we become a master of the game around junior high. And um, somehow as we grow up, we tend to let it go and find ourselves in a place that we're powerful and you know we enjoy being with other people and with respect and create close relationships. It could be that any point of those skills that we've generated in a junior high can show up at any moment, whether they're, you know, you know it, it, where we feel powerless and we need to gain power or we are in competition at work or in any uh, place that, you know, that needs to show up as a coping mechanism. But to really look at how are we using it? Why are we using it? Is it useful? Uh, what type of relationships can we create if that is part of the way that we are with people and then how are we receiving it and how do we react to it so it's important for you to see if that strategy works for you or not for more observational skills and seeing how to think feel and behave in different areas of your life go to my book 
Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. Um, for healing and releasing the toxic residuals of belittling or acquiring skills to deal with your anger in a more healthy way um, and express it in a more healthy way or even gaining attention in a more healthy way so that you don't have to only get the consequences of being belittled or belittling others. Be right back. Dr. Fujian Zhang. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach for the past 30 years, and I'm the originator of the awareness integration therapy. I'd love to be able to support you in any matters of life that shows up for you that you need support. So call me at 818-648-2140. I am available to do online therapy or coaching, anyone who's around the world. And my, you can also join me in my office in San Clemente, California, if you'd like to uh, come to the office. So call me at 818-648-2140 or go to fujon.com. I look forward to hearing from you and having the opportunity to support you in things that are in your life and you just want to excel and create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Here's the latest research. Children born to mothers who are depressed during and after pregnancy are more likely to develop depressive symptoms themselves by the age of 24. This is according to a new research led by the University of Bristol. By the age of 24, young people born to mothers with antenatal and postnatal depression had depression scores three times, almost three points higher than offsprings of mothers with no depression. The study also considered the impact of the father's depression, although the sample was very, very small. The study was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry, and the study looked at survey information for 5,029 individuals during a 14-year period from ages of 10 to 24 to examine how the risk of depression, um, the risk of depression occur across childhood and adolescent. Researchers also found that offsprings of mothers with a history of postnatal depression had an increase in depressive symptoms over time, while those with mothers with history of antenatal depression have higher overall levels of depression throughout. This suggests that the importance of antenatal and postnatal depression support and interventions are important. Thanks to data from world-renowned health study children of 90s, also known as Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, researchers could explore the pattern of offspring depressive symptoms based on the various timing of maternal depression um, and see if there were any characteristics or differences in when and for what duration the offsprings of depressed mothers were depressed themselves. The researchers stated, by tracking trajectories of repeated measures of mood in offsprings of depressed mothers from childhood through to adulthood, they were able to provide further insight into how the well-known integrational, uh, intergenerational risk of depressed mood presented itself over time. The study showed that the children of parents with both antenatal and postnatal depression are at greatest risk of depression themselves. And this risk appears to persist throughout adolescent into early uh, adulthood. Um, the research looked at the impact of the depression in both mothers and fathers. And um, it seems like um, the timing that shows that the timing of depression in parents during pregnancy and after childbirth or both, and if the mother and father were both affected are all important risk factors for the children's future mental health. And the good news is there are effective evidence-based treatments and the earlier we can provide them, the better it is. So part of the importance of this conversation and the research is that uh, many times mothers or fathers, um, they even assume that if they are depressed, that having a child or the next child would actually make them feel better 
Unfortunately, um, it's not going to make them feel better. Some people who have been depressed, they're definitely going to have postpartum depression. So it's important for uh, the person, not only from a genetic place, but also behaviorally, uh, knowing that they need to get um, treatment because uh, a parent who is depressed their demeanor, their behavior, their tonality, the conversation they have, the, you know, through their voice, through their words, through their teachings, um, all of that is going to be given to the child. So the child not only genetically has that, but experientially and behaviorally, that becomes part of their life. They becomes part of the way they view life. And uh, so depression becomes part of the schema or the storyline that they have about themselves, about the world, the meanings that they give it, and that's how they uh, move forward. So I've heard children as um, as young as five years old, where there's one mistake, where there's something happening, and you know that their brother takes something away, and they give this type of a generalization of everybody, you know, is going to take away something. It's hopeless. I'm never going to get better. And you could hear these types of uh, sentences that are part of a child uh, that you know, is, is hearing this from their mother or father, and they repeat these sentences, which are a complete generalization of one or two things that are going wrong. So you could see that if you are depressed, um, get help. The help is out there. Their behavioral help, their psychotherapy, they're looking at all of that. There's medical help. Uh, there are also different versions of um, um, new treatments that have come up. Um, across the United States that you can help with uh, brain stimulation, with a ketamine, um, with different types of uh, ways of handling the brain that are going to be different than just, um, you know, side by side by psychotherapy to give you different skills. So if you are depressed, please seek help because it's going, uh, it's, it's, you don't deserve to be suffering when there are treatments. Um, in the model that I created, awareness integration model, and the book Life Reset, we did a study on specifically depression and anxiety in Cal State Long Beach, and we saw that just even by psychotherapy and even self-help, do using this model of awareness integration, people minimize their depression about six to seven percent. So, I'm sharing this with you because I know that we could definitely. Uh, take away some of the symptoms and give you skills and how to handle it. So take care of yourself because you deserve it. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zain. I'm a psychotherapist and a life coach for the past 30 years. And I'm the originator of the awareness integration therapy. I'd love to be able to support you in any matters of life that shows up for you that you need support. So call me at 818-648-2140. I am available to do online therapy or coaching, anyone who's around the world. And my, you can also join me in my office in San Clemente, California, if you'd like to uh, come to the office. So call me at 818-648-2140 or go to fujon.com. I look forward to hearing from you and having the opportunity to support you in things that are in your life and you just want to excel and create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zain. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, and I am excited to be with Radha Ruparel. She is a global cross-sector leader with expertise in leadership development and personal transformation. She has worked with CEOs for of Fortune 500 senior executives, social entrepreneurs, and grassroots leaders around the world, and heads the Collective Leadership Accelerator at Teach for All a global network of independent organizations in 60 countries committed to developing leadership in classrooms and communities to ensure all children fulfill their potential. She holds a dual master's degrees from Harvard University and is the author of the Amazon bestseller, Brave Now, Rise Through Struggle and Unlock Your Greatest Self. Welcome to the show. Hi, nice to be with you. So as I was going through your book, Brave Now, I saw that you started your whole prospect and, and the writing the book from you actually getting ill with the COVID. So I'm sure that a lot of people want to know how, what you went through and how come this inspired you so much to write about it and uh, go through your own experience and uh, move through it, really, and then want to share it with the rest of us. Yeah, so a little bit about this, Dr. Fujian. So this was April 2020. Um, this was the beginning of the global pandemic. I'm in New York City. Um, and at this point, uh, you'll remember COVID was very new. I didn't personally know anyone who had gotten sick. And I started the, the year at the top of my game, you know, working in a job I love with people around me whom I love, uh, completely healthy, completely fit. And then one day in April, uh, I was on a conference call and I started losing, losing my breath. And I got off the call and just a few hours later, I was completely bedridden. And within a couple of days, I realized that I've got this new virus that everyone had been talking about. Then the next, the next few weeks were just, uh, uh, horrific. Uh, I, I had bouts of fatigue where I thought someone had drugged me with sleeping pills, chest pains. I would wake up in the middle of the night gasping for air. So I had a few months where, you know, I wasn't even sure if I was going to make it. And luckily, luckily I made it through that um, and, and ended up being one of those, one of those people who's suffering from, from long COVID. So I've had a long, long journey um, since then. And to this day, while I'm doing much better, um, I'm still still struggling with with the virus and, and some of the aftermaths of it. But the 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 book came about because as I was going through probably the most challenging experience of my life, as you know, I work with leaders around the world around how do they manage uncertainty? How do they tap into their inner strength? How do they lean on others in times of hardship? And all of these lessons I've been working with other leaders on for 20 years, I had to apply those to myself on a daily basis just to make it through. Mm -hmm. And so as I started discovering that, I realized maybe there's a bright side of the struggle that I went through is that I can share some of the lessons that I've worked with others on with others in the world because I had to live them every day myself. In, uh, in your book, you share about being brave and you um, share the meaning that you have for that. And you say, taking on each day newly, even in the face of fear, treating yourself and others with compassion, even when it's hard, embracing adversity as a, as a source of wisdom and connection and being vulnerable enough to let the world experience the real you, perfectly imperfect, just as you are. Being brave is not an intimate characteristics reserved for a selected few. At any moment, any of us can choose to be brave. So share with us the way you were brave. Yeah, so I think people have this image of brave as you know, heroic, courageous leaders who are doing big acts. And what I realized was, first of all, in, in any moment, as I mentioned, we have this choice and we have this ability to be brave. So what I realized bravery meant was just the little things. For example, Pujan, I grew up thinking that being strong and being brave means when you're struggling to something, hiding it, you know, keeping it to yourself, trying to power through. But one of the things that started happening to me in my first couple of weeks of this illness was people started reaching out to me. They said, how can I help? And again, in the early days, I didn't even know how to accept that help. I had this one colleague from work who would reach out to me every day. 
finally, I started opening up and saying, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I need your support. And, and again, doing that with a work colleague, it's uh, you have to be a little bit vulnerable. That's what I realized. It was those moments when I said, I need your help. This is what's actually going on that I discovered you no know, great connection. Uh, I think the other thing is how we approach every day. So I would go to bed at night and in the next morning, I would promise myself that I'm gonna start the day and no matter what happened the previous day, let's look at each day anew and take that on. So I think bravery is not just about these big moments, it's about these choices we make in every little moment. Can you share about uh, being seen, allowing yourself to be seen and allowing your, um, your vulnerabilities to also be seen? And that is, a, is something that is called brave. Uh, one of the things that I um, experienced with COVID is um, obviously I, you know, I'm a, I've been a therapist for 30 years. So I work with a lot of stigmas. Could you try again? Okay. Siri is talking to us while we're <laughs> She's interested in the conversation, right? Absolutely. Well, yeah, thank you for coming. We're not need, needing you in here. Um, one of the things that I constantly deal with is a, obviously a stigma of, of mental health uh, illnesses. And um, when COVID showed up, it's interesting that people needed to hide this. I don't know why. Um, I don't know if you've had that experience with other people, if there was any part of you that also felt... Uh, that you shouldn't show your vulnerability. And then yet in your book, you also talk about the place in, within ourselves that at one point needs to be able to receive, like you just said, people come in and want to help. Um, where is it that I can see myself as okay to be vulnerable? Where is it that I can share with the world what my needs are? And that also takes a courage and bravery to be able to say, I do need help. Because I think, you know, working with leaders um, and always people are talking about how can I lead? How can I be strong? How can I this, this, this? And that's what I want to show the world, but not my vulnerability. And it seems like that is also a part that we feel powerful when we powerfully share our vulnerabilities too. What are your thoughts and experience about that? Sure. So I do think our society has made it hard to do that. And I think there is a turning point right now, though. So as a leader, again, I used to project strength, but now I've come to work and I've been very purposeful about sharing my story. Now, I'm not saying there weren't moments where I was worried, you know, will people worry I can't do it? Will they worry I'm not going to be good enough? Will they worry that I'm weak? And so you do have this moment where you're putting yourself out there and it is a risk. Um, but, but here's the thing that I discovered, Fujian. When I wrote my book and I put my story out in the world, hundreds of people reached out to me from you know, 80 year olds to 20 year olds, from people in the corporate sector to people working as teachers on the ground. And each of them started sharing a story with me about something that they were dealing with. You know, whether it was a health issue or being a mother in this time and, and managing kids from home or something else. And oftentimes people had been hiding these things for, for decades. And this was the first time they had an opening to talk about it. And so what it makes me think is each of us is quite human and we have these stories. And what I do think we need to do is create more space and more purpose in our organizations, in our other environments to have the safety for people to come forward. Because I think if we did, not only would, would work and life be more joyful, but I also think we can develop stronger relationships that will make a work together even more powerful. And that's what I found with some of my colleagues who we have deep trusted relationships with. Absolutely. You also talk about letting go and being with what is, with what's so. And um, I know that in the time of vulnerability, uh, we usually have the concept of resistance, resisting the vulnerability, resisting of what is like, I don't want this pain. I don't want this illness. I don't want this condition. Um, I don't want this economic condition. I don't, I don't need any of this. And sometimes we get caught in what we had um, and not willing to let that go. Or um, sometimes we're caught in the vision of what we fantasized about 
and we say, no, nothing else who can't needs to come in front of me. And I'm not going to accept anything unless the one that I envisioned that I have to get there. And, and not being with what is in front of us, um, it's almost like an illusion that we keep insisting and in being in. And you also you talk about how to let go and be with what is so we can move toward and through it. So can you share a bit about that? Absolutely. This is a lesson I, I keep le relearning on a daily basis, and it's probably one of the most powerful lessons. So, you know, when I fell ill, again, I had this vision of what my life should be. I should be perfectly fit, perfectly active, be able to do everything that I've always been able to do. And this last year has been challenging because, you know, just as a small example, I used to play tennis, surf and run. Now, the only exercise I'm allowed to do is walking. Um, for now, for now at least. Uh, for the first few months, I completely resisted that. I was so frustrated and so angry. I'd walk by my local park and the tennis courts, and I'd think to myself, wait, I should be playing. I should be able to do that. And this is just one small example. It wasn't until I finally let go that I started seeing what was right there in front of me. I can still walk. I can go to the park every day. You know, I can breathe. And what was beautiful about that was not only did I get present to what I could actually do, but I started finding wonder in that. Now, even if I could go back to my crazy exercise routine, I don't think I would, you know, because I've discovered the beauty in, in walking and in being with nature in using that as a time to connect with people in my life. And I think in, in so many other ways, oftentimes what we resist persists. But oftentimes when we let go of that resistance on the other, other side is discovery. You know, we might discover nature. We might discover something new that, we, that, that, that emerges. We might discover connection with other human beings when we're going through pain that we wouldn't have otherwise. So I think this is a constant lesson, particularly in a world that's uncertain. You know, we can't expect certainty. I think that's the thing that oftentimes kills us. Yes. Um, I think there is a there is a yearning uh, for certainty, and then yet the funny thing is everything is so uncertain, <laughs> and in the midst of all is uh, uncertainty, we're constantly trying to grab on something that is certain, and then we pretend that that's really what the world looks like a certainty, which it really isn't. The um, the important part of your book is also, I think, that uh, when you talk about embrace suffering, which I think is something that we all say no to, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it's like the system says, no, I'm not going to embrace it. And um, this has got to go. So it's the same resistance that we have with any type of pain. Um, you know, there's a way that we are not... A, I guess there's a way we induce suffering for ourselves because we're resisting what's there. And you share about how to embrace suffering, how to let go of unnecessary suffering and how to actually find strength in suffering. So can you share a bit about that? Sure, right. And I think that's the distinction there. There's, there's, un, there's some suffering that's just necessary by the fact that we're human beings. We're going to love people and we're going to lose them. We are going to have health and then it's going to disappear. And so if we assume there's no suffering in life, we're going to be miserable because we're going to be resisting the very nature of being human, which means there's suffering and joy. Um, but I think there is some suffering that's unnecessary. And I think that's oftentimes our resistance. So one of the things I've learned is that instead of resisting suffering all the time, sometimes just embrace it. You know, I'm an optimist, but one of the things that I learned through this experience was sometimes it's important to just be with your emotions just as they are. <laughs> Today, I'm feeling sad. Today, I'm feeling frustrated. Today, I'm feeling angry. I mean, oftentimes we don't even allow ourselves to feel that or we numb it with working or exercise or alcohol or some other numbing behavior. And so I think if we can just accept life will have ups and downs and actually be with that a bit and sit with that for a moment, sometimes the power from that the suffering and angst actually disappears when we just let it be. Let me just let it be. There's a beautiful poem um, by Rumi, this Persian poet, and he talks about emotions and, and how we can allow them to be visitors in our house. You know, let them come, 
stay for a while, embrace the wisdom they have to offer you and let them go. And so that's a lot of how I think about suffering. Let it be there, but then let it go when it's time. Um, you complete your book with um, rediscovering joy and coming to embrace who you are and your interconnectedness to the world. And uh, waking up, waking up and activating your soul, waking up to what's possible, waking up to care for yourself and your body. Um, and some of it happens with even acknowledging death as is. It's like, it, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes acknowledging death and facing it, it comes back and we have gratitude for everything that we do have in life. Um, when we look at an ending, but then we suddenly enjoy what is versus when we don't look at the ending, we're constantly going to the next level, to the next level. And maybe we're, um, we're letting go of what is the present moment. So you come, you know, you come in with um, your message of you being important, time being important, life being important, body being important, your soul being important. And uh, the connections that we have in the world are being important and how to uh, value all of these components and then connect all of it, connect the body and the soul and others and, you know, the contribution, the gratitude, the compassion, the love of living in abundance and having it all be a part of, um, of who we are every minute. Yes, you know, we know intellectually time is finite, but it's not until you have a moment like this that you really grasp it. And so for me, what's, the, what's been the gift that I've gotten from this experience is that I don't waste time anymore. And what's, what's so fascinating for Jen is when I first fell ill, and this is counterintuitive, I would have hours a day that technically I would lose because I would have to lie down just to make it through the day. So technically I had less time in the day. But what's surprising was I felt like I had more. And the only thing that I did was I was present in the moments that I did have. So if I was with someone, instead of being distracted, I was with them. If I was walking outside, I would actually notice that I'm walking and, and taking in a breath of fresh air, which I never noticed before. And so I think it's such a simple but small lesson is we have so much beauty around us. If you open your eyes and just notice these small things, you know, a hug with your child or partner in the morning, instead of taking that for granted, give them a mindful embrace. You know, when you're with someone, don't be distracted. Sometimes five minutes of quality time is better than two hours of uninterrupted time. So I think that's the thing that I've discovered. Finding joy, sometimes it's not about doing something big. It's just around being more present with all of the beautiful things that are already all around you. Absolutely. Um, in one minute or so, is there anything that we haven't shared about your experience, about your book, about something that you want our audience to know? Um, what would that be? Yeah, I think that the one thing I'll say is in connecting with so many other people who are dealing with things, the biggest thing I've discovered is we're all going to have these turning points in our life. You know, we'll go through an illness, we'll, we'll, lose a job, we'll get out of a relationship that meant something to us. And so that's going to happen. And so I think the question is, how are we going to deal with that? You know, we can either cower or we can rise up stronger. And my biggest thought to leave you all with is, I believe we all have this deep inner strength and wisdom within us. And so take a moment, slow down, pause, and give yourself a chance to discover that. Because I think when I had a chance to pause and discover that for myself and in so many others around me, there's incredible beauty there. So that's, that's, that's all I wanna leave you with. And in any moment, you have a choice of how you wanna react. And I believe we all have the capacity to um, discover that strength within us. Brave now, uh, rise through struggle and unlock your greatest self. And you really have shared uh, the most vulnerable parts of yourself and how you have embraced uh, your courage um, through the process of the struggle and suffering and uncertainty toward 
envisioning, connecting, and coming to terms with who you really are, your essence, and you really share that in not only the most vulnerable way, but also the most, um, the most of the strength uh, to give both sides of the coin to, to the readers of this book. So everyone, uh, get the book. Um, you can get it from brave no, bravenowbook.com. You can get more information, Amazon or anywhere else that it's sold uh, by Radha Ruperel. It is beautiful. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for sharing yourself with us. Thank you so much for having me. And um, don't go anywhere, everyone. We'll be right back. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. This is to all of you therapists, counselors, coaches, and teachers out there offering you my latest book, Awareness Integration Therapy. Clear the past, create a new future, and live a fulfilled life now. Every person that reaches out to a psychotherapist, a counselor, or a coach is seeking to learn skills that can be utilized daily to foster a successful and fulfilling life. So this book offers an effective tool to all psychotherapists and coaches for supporting their clients to become aware of their inner process and to be accountable for it as well as the results in all areas of their lives with the utmost level of care and acceptance. This is a must read for all of you clinicians and coaches who desire to offer a deep therapeutic work in a brief period of time suited for this era. This is the Ask Me segment. Thank you so much for sending your questions. One of the questions that I got is, why do we sabotage ourselves? How come that we set up a goal, we really want this, we make effort, we go on and get it, and then zip, hold it, don't go further in it and we start sabotaging ourselves and it's like what happened if I didn't want it why did I make such an effort to create it and I've seen this with people who have gone and uh, put themselves into uh, school and education and they came out with two hundred thousand dollars of or more of a loan and then yet uh, they get their degrees they get their licenses and then uh, they sabotage it one way or another. They're not pursuing it. They won't go in it. They'll just say, I didn't want to anymore. Or they do something within that profession that their licenses are taken away and um, their career is pretty much shot. I've known people who've wanted to be married and have children and create a family. And that was their biggest goal. And they got it all. Finally, they were, you know, got married with the, with the mate that they really wanted and all is well. And then they begin sabotaging it by the anger and, you know, sense of entitlement and constantly fighting within that system of the marriage. And finally, their divorce papers are there and they're like, I don't just don't want to be with you anymore. So you can see where people really want something and they do so much to get it and then ruin it immediately. Well, there appear, appears to be uh, some type of a duality where although one part of us wants something and wants the success and makes the effort, another part has a different belief system. Maybe it has a different belief system and I don't deserve this, or it should be another way, or uh, I don't even know who I am in this space where I know who I was without it and then I wanted it, but then now that I'm here, I have no idea 
who I am. And then the same type of anxieties of not knowing the uncertainty of the new way of being might trigger a lot of the wrong coping mechanisms or the way that I used to deal with uh, in order to go back. I've known people who wanted to be a certain way. They've worked so hard to get to that weight and then they didn't know who they were. I lost 50 pounds, 60 pounds started getting people to look at them and pay attention to them. And they were so uncomfortable with this attention that they started eating again and gained their way back. So it's almost like there's a wish that we want and then we get the wish, but we have no idea who we are. So it's important to build a new identity with this new wish. And sometimes we'll get the wish and then we're trying to build the identity as it shows up and it's scary for us. So role modeling after people who are in that position, looking at the best that they've created and then integrating it into our system about who I am today as I've gained the new relationship, as I've gained the success, the success of the new business, of the new uh, body image that I have, of the new wealth that I've acquired, all of that. In that way, I can create my new identity, which is a combination of what I was before and who I was before and some of those behaviors with the combination of a new set of behavior that creates success in the new concept. So if a part of me is sabotaging is because it hasn't been upgraded to this level and it's still operating on some old level that was there, whether I thought I didn't deserve it, whether I thought I wasn't good enough for it, whether I thought I'm scared and won't be able to survive this or whether I thought I got it, but it's not something that I wanted to have. Uh, so all of those are the different types of belief systems that if I don't attend to it, subconsciously are going to come in and take away everything that I've just built. So the awareness of all of these different parts that are coming together and how each one of them may have a different need and comes together and those needs have to be taken care of and negotiated for me to be in a new business, in a new way of a socioeconomic class, in a new way of a, a body image that I have, in new in relationships that I want to um, be in, in a new way of vulnerability, in a new way of success, all of those are new ways of being. When we have an image of creation of something, we only have the image of what the create, you know, what the outcome would look like. We might not have the vision of who would I be as that outcome shows up and would I be comfortable with it or not. And sometimes we won't know all of it until we're there. So sometimes it's on the job training where I have to start integrating those uh, places. Most people, if they're not watching all other areas, all the inner voices that are telling them what I want and what I don't want and ignore them, deny them, avoid them, those inner voices, if they're not taken care of, they'll come in and will pay you the consequences. So watching, hearing, honoring yourself in all of those aspects will make, you know, will be in a way that you will be able to you know, negotiate, give those parts of you the things they want, and then integrate in the two new system that you've worked so hard to get. Thank you. Well, this is our show today. Thank you so much for being with us. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.